what did I just say? I just said so many words. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, I'm talking I so much, but I have so more to words. say. Words, words, words. What's up, y'all? Thank you for watching The Real News Network. Please do not forget, if you're watching this on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. We are sitting here. I'm Easy Jackson. I'm with my co-host, Tracy Beal. We are doing a series of interviews with The Real News staff. We started a couple weeks ago with one with Paul J. Today, we are sitting with Donna Noor and Steve Horn. Hi. I'm doing ASMR for the whole interview. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Do the whole interview like that. Okay. Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that just threw you off, didn't it? These oh, are our, just... <laughs> our these are our very silly climate change reporters. Uh, no, they're awesome. You guys, um, you guys are covering climate change, and we're gonna today's episode is gonna be about about that, about the work that you're doing, uh, and about the urgency in which we are facing. Okay, <laughs> climate change. <laughs> Oh, am I? Oh, I'm supposed to go yes, next. You're the... We clearly we had way too much fun before this started. So okay. pardon me. <laughs> so I'm gonna start with Darna. I think a lot of people are very familiar with Darna. Hi, you, you've yes. been with the real people news love now. Darna. Yeah, we've been talking about coffee, and I just realized that I think I am actually <laughs> overcaffeinated now. Mm. Anyway, sorry. Go ahead. You've been with the real news now what four or five years? I think five, five years. Five years. Yeah. So our audience is very familiar with you. So. Tell us a little bit about like what you think is the most urgent or the most urgent issues with regards to climate change. Like what do people really need to know? Like those that don't understand. Um, I mean, I think that so climate change itself uh, is such an urgent issue and I think is often covered like something that's going to be <laughs> an urgent, like something that we have to deal with because it's going to be really bad in the future. Mm -hmm. But in fact, like as all of us know, and I'm sure that if you're watching this you probably know climate change is something that's already happening right now um there's already like islands that have gone underwater uh there's tons of parts of the world that are facing crazy droughts and flooding um and like that all of that is going to continue uh and get worse as climate change makes it worse as climate change uh, impacts weather patterns around the world and uh impacts the world that we live in uh, but also along the way, I think it's important to highlight the the ways that the industries that are changing the world's climate have are already like having Im immediate impacts too. So mm -hmm. like, it's not just about uh, you know uh, trash incinerators, carbon emissions eventually making climate change worse. It's also about you know that trash incinerator is probably owned by a company that uh, you know is pushing this uh, concentrated wealth and power, uh, but also that trash incinerator is emitting not just carbon, but other, uh, you know, pollutants and stuff that can have like really horrible health impacts for people that like, can cause cancer and can uh, cause stroke and, you know, worsen people's asthma and stuff like that. So I think that making those connections is yeah. really important and like a pretty easy, I don't know, it's easy to like, if you already are seeing the immediate effects of something to like mm -hmm. imagine what it could be. You put it to me very yeah. simply one day, uh, when it, it, it was a few months back when you first started doing this and I asked you a question you said people are going to die and if you and if you associate this with death when you're mm -hmm. explaining it to people then they understand the urgency a little more like this means that you you're you're the trajectory that you think you have you probably don't have yeah and and people already are dying like and yeah. have yeah. Die at our like all the time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, from from uh, n natural disasters or weather patterns that would be already bad. I mean, they're called natural disasters. They've become not just natural. The ma you know, the activity of humans and corporations be and carbon emissions into the atmosphere have made those disasters more catastrophic. Right. So. We're seeing it already, and there, it's sort of like a premonition of what could come later um, in, in more frequency and with even greater impact. So th yeah. that we've seen it already, and we yeah. may. And I think it, the, the other kind of piggybacking off of Darna, uh, even the business press, so Bloomberg, they're they you know they don't call it climate change coverage; they call it climate changed yep. with a D. It's mm. it's changed. It's changing more, mm. but it's. It's not something yeah. just in the future because they're right. showing they care about it because it's 
affecting even Wall Street's mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. bottom line and big businesses' bottom line. So I mean, they they care about it for a different reason than people who care about environmental justice care about it, but. It's definitely on their radar. That's the business yeah. press. That's the the voice of business. Yeah. That's, that's an important yeah. thing, and I want to come back to that. But at first, I want I want you to introduce yourself to folks, Steve. Steve is uh, is one of our newest staff members here. Um, Steve Horn, tell us where you come from. You know, uh, who are you, and what, what 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 you're planning to get done here at the Real News. Sure. So I yeah, I'm, I'm joining the climate team with Darna, and I'm going to focus and be living in San Diego, California, uh, and covering mostly, but not only, California, um, a mix of California and national politics and stuff, in, but especially stuff on the, the West Coast will be a heavy focus uh, of mine. Uh, my background is I did climate reporting for about six years for a website called Dsmog, or Dsmog Blog, as it used to be known, and um, for one year, I took a kind of a hiatus and worked on prison, a, a publication called Prison Legal News, and focused on human rights issues in America's massive prison system. But I um, have always been a huge fan of the real news. I've been a guest many times over the years and uh, saw that they're looking to build yeah. up the Climate Crisis Bureau and wanted to be part of what, they're, what we're doing here. So Yeah. I want to find out, and this is this is my community organizer questioning. Actually, it was Tracy's idea. I thought it was a great question, though. What what about you two? And you can answer, Donna, and then you follow us, Steve. What about you personally is connected to this? Like, how does this how does this fall in line with who you are as an individual? Because so many people have jobs, mm-hmm. and I think people out there should know that a lot of us here work at the Real News because we believe in what we're doing. Um, right. You know, it's not just, you know, we're not just assigned a seat and then just sitting here mm-hmm. doing this work. So tell me about how this, you know, relates to you personally. I, I feel like I should have known that you were going <laughs> to ask that, but it's such a good question that I like. Um. <laughs> So, okay, I'm going to steal somebody else's answer that I heard one time. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Basa Fazen, who is the uh, climate program director, I don't know what his title exactly is, at mm-hmm. the Institute for Policy Studies, um, explains it like this. He says that um, he's, my family is from India, his family is also from India, um, and a lot, uh, one like sort of important cultural touchstone for so many people in India, the huge population of India is the Ganges River. And the Ganges River is drying up right now because of mm-hmm. climate change. Um, and this shows the impact not only that climate has on like, you know, drought um, causes food shortages and causes, you know, people to die because they don't have water. But it also really like severely impacts the culture of the world and like how people think of themselves and how people interact with the rest of human society. Um, and I think that thinking about it, like my, I don't, I, I always tend to think about things like that. Like I think to, I tend to think about how these sort of quote unquote natural disasters have impacts that are not just, you know, obviously it's very, very important that people are dying right now and we mm-hmm. need to do everything that we can to stop people from like, you know, having their lives affected in terrible ways. But also like, it's not going to be the same, like there's no going yeah. back now and all we can do is move forward. So I think mm-hmm. that those kinds of. Yeah. Looking at like the way that culture is impacted and the way that the world as a whole is impacted is really important to me. Does that answer your question? No, totally. Yeah. Totally. Oh my God. That's why it's important to you. Yeah. yeah. That's dope. That's super dope. And you didn't yeah. steal somebody's answer. You heard you heard your answer <laughs> articulated well. Thanks, Basa. If you're probably not <laughs> <laughs> he stole it from you. <laughs> right. What about you, Steve? Well, for me, um, my kind of my entrance into this was into this whole world and caring about you know, independent media and caring about climate change and all the issues that fall underneath that banner came. I was a student at University of Wisconsin mm-hmm. in Madison, which is a kind of a historically a very kind of yeah. activist front line. Where the of, thugs are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Madison, Wisconsin. Shout <laughs> yeah. out to Madison, Wisconsin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, no. Yeah, no, it's cool. Yeah. So I was in, I was uh, finishing college uh, the year of the the, uh, what's known as the Wisconsin Uprising, the mm. labor uprising at that time where worker, there's like 100,000 yeah. people out in the streets around the Capitol mm. um, ag- against a bill that would have, uh, be- or actually did uh, beat back against some uh, pl- collective bargaining rights that labor had in Wisconsin. But 
Um, at that same time, that was the year of the Arab Spring. Uh, that was the year of the civil disobedience movement against uh, the Keystone XL pipeline in Washington, D.C. Mm-hmm. So there's was kind of like a time of yeah. an Occupy that was all the same year. So mm-hmm. what I thought was cool about the climate movement, I guess, was that it was it's and still is very much engaged in direct action activism, civil disobedience, things mm-hmm. that I think that people are willing to kind of are so passionate about this issue that they're willing to even put go to jail for it, yeah. go to prison for it. People have in the United States. So I thought that for me, that was actually my education on the issue. I wasn't that into climate in college, but I was interested in what are people doing in activism in general. Um, and I saw what the climate movement was doing and I really wanted to be reporting on it because I thought that it was, you know, people like Tim to Christopher, for example, during that time he went to federal prison for a couple of years because yeah. of actions he took at a auction for leasing coal. So, and others, you know, but yeah, that's, that's kind of my, yeah my short that, answer. That kind of shit excites me so much. It, it's yeah. be- because you, you question whether or not you're doing the right thing when you're in a cell by yourself, you know, and, and you're like, okay, this is what I wanted to do. There's a reason why I'm doing this. And it is to shed light on issues to the point where young Steve is watching and he's like, oh, holy shit, I'm about right. to get out there. I want to come back to something you were saying earlier. Uh, and, 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 and both of y'all, I want you to chime in on this. You talked about how Bloomberg and these corporations are now looking at climate change as something, you know, that's affecting them. But they are overwhelmingly Republican when you talk about the when you talk about businesses or conservative rather. I won't say Republican. I'll say conservative, right? Overwhelmingly conservative when it comes to business, when it comes to finances, mm-hmm. when it comes to you know that world, corporations. Um, do you see a messaging being trickled down to their followers? Because these dumb MAGA motherfuckers think that like liberals are making up climate change. You yeah, know what I'm saying? Real. And it's not a real a thing. You know what I'm saying? But if if corporations are seeing it now, are they, do you think they're going to be slick about messaging, or do you think that it's going to get to a point where they're going to be like, no, guys, like this is real? I mean, well. So it's interesting. You, Steve, was mentioning the publication Bloomberg, but Bloomberg, like New York City's Michael Bloomberg, is not a Republican and is thought of as kind of a climate hero, right? And I think that he, like, mm-hmm. he has such a huge platform as like yeah. somebody talking about climate change that I actually mm-hmm. think that his message is like the word you use is trickling down to so many people. Okay. Um, and he's. I don't, there's a lot of people like this who are very technocratic about the kinds of solutions that they think they can bring to the climate crisis. Um, mm-hmm. And there's a lot of talk about how uh, for some people, for lots of, I think, liberal, like uh, people in you know liberal corporate circles about how climate change could be like a business opportunity because, oh, there's so much money in green energy now. Um, mm-hmm. There's like so, mm-hmm. you know, there are so many different like technologies that we can bring and they can make us so much money and we can save the planet at the same time. And like, uh, obviously, like I'm, report. I'm a reporter here. This isn't about like m- the shit that I do here isn't about my opinions. But like as me personally, as a human being, I'm just so skeptical of that because the way that we got into this whole thing in the first place is because of this, you know, like extreme concentrated wealth, concentrated right. power in the hands yep. of so few people who are, like, can essentially ignore like the health impacts of their decisions. Um, so like I so I don't think that it's just that there's like this climate denial that's trickling down, but also this idea that like oh the climate crisis is something that we can take on in this like sort of business focused way. Mm. Um, yeah, that's. Well, for me, I think just to talk about that Bloomberg thing just for a second longer and, and the business sort of that sector of big business that is because not all big business is in line with right. with that. Right. Um, that yeah that that is like the kind of the educated you could say it's a mix of you know liberals and conservatives who are in business will mm-hmm. read bloomberg it's kind of straight reporting it's really good reporting in terms of you know kind of both mostly just i mean they're reporting on business but yeah. like the wall street journal if you want to get news about business you should still read it mm-hmm. um but yeah there's that whole other world which i think that we'll do reporting on and that's on climate denial there's a whole segment of big business 
that's separate from that, like funded by the Koch brothers yeah. or funded by others. They have a whole network. It's not just them. It's the Koch right. brothers network who f- have spent hundreds of millions of dollars creating a network around the country and every state in the country that we made a documentary about this prolifer- one time. Yeah. If you're watching this. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, that network continues and, and I think it will, it would probably continue even the Koch brothers are both pretty old, uh, mm-hmm. but they've created a network that will, live beyond even their livelihoods. Um, and so that's something that exists. And I think that's one of the the biggest barriers in the United States is that there is this disinformation that is brought out to so many people through that network, which has some influence. I mean, people always say Fox News, but it's not just Fox News. I think more important yeah. is, because really what, they don't really talk about climate change that much at all in general on any of the big networks. Yeah. What's more important is that they have a big presence on the internet and social media. And yeah. so that's how a lot of people are getting mm-hmm. their information about climate change. Yeah. So what can we do, like just as regular everyday folks like myself, like before coming here, I, I was aware of climate change. I got it, it was sort of like this ambiguous thing to me. Like, okay, the you know, climate is technically changing. I see a difference in literally like the weather and the different things that happen in parts of the world that make big news, right? Um, but it didn't really, it just didn't, re- like it didn't relate to me personally, or I didn't feel like it related to me personally until I learned a little bit more. So like, what can people do personally themselves to change things? <laughs> Do you want to? Do you want to go first? I feel like there are so many different ways. To I, well, yeah, this I'll go first. Question. So, so um, I mean, yeah, there, there, there's a. I'll, I'll just I'll give a journalistic answer just because I don't like to necessarily tell people what they should do, but I can I can give the parameters oh, of what others. The question say. literally is asking you to tell people. <laughs> what you know, it's, right, I forget. I'll give my, like, the I'll journalist, give, yeah. you have to tell be like, people what the fuck. Opinion they, neutral. Uh, you know, there's some On people show, out there can... that are very educated, but there's somebody yeah. that's going to watch this and they don't know the first thing to do. And but there are very simple things other than just I agree, recycling. But also, uh, yeah, no, I can give some basics, and, and but I'll still say this is. Give us there, one, there two, are, three. Yeah, sure. So, <laughs> um, I think you know one of the the biggest things, and Darna probably wanted to say it, so but I'm going to say it is. Go for it. Um, it's not really discussed that much within the climate movement, but um, eating a lot of meat and the, agric- the agricultural industry is a huge emitter. Ah, uh, here we mm. go with the vegan agenda. I know, agenda. it's not, it's not, and, then, and what I say is you do not have to become a vegan, but, you know, think about how much meat you consume and maybe okay. minima- minimize yeah. the amount of meat you consume because that is just a huge avenue of carbon emissions globally. Okay. Um, My parents are probably watching yeah. this and they'll be very happy that you said that. <laughs> very interesting. There we go. Meanwhile, I'm I'm I was just saying that for them. Uh, <laughs> and then, you know, another big one, if your state has it, is try to minimize driving. I mean, it, it, mm. but mm. I mean, that's a kind of an obvious one. I want to think of one that's not. I don't try, know. Try I, walk, you know what? I don't think either of those are very I, I, obvious. No, I'll, I'll, okay, I'll say it this way. If your city, a, thing, a big thing about city planning, um, and it's just like not normally talked about and not always talked about in this way, but city planning needs to probably needs to incorporate more walkable cities and bikeable cities like that exist in Europe, like that exist in some mm-hmm. places. Like right, I said Madison, Wisconsin, there's mm-hmm. bike paths that you can get throughout the entire city of Madison, Wisconsin, mm. east, west, north, south, through bike paths. Mm. You do not need to own a car. I mean, yeah. if it's really cold, you probably don't want to yeah, own a bike got Yeah, we got a little yeah. city There's in buses. Maryland called Columbia that's kind of like that. Like, okay. you can get around yeah. on the paths a lot in Columbia. And I think pe- people would do it. I think everyone would say, oh, people are lazy, they drive their cars. Well, if, they, if that's all they can do, then they're yeah. going to drive their car. If they have that's the option you know. to bike, the, mm-hmm. they might bike. The, a yeah. lot of people in Madison bike. So. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And, and in addition to people being like, oh, People are lazy if they can drive their cars, they will. I think that there's this sort of idea that like only uh, white people ride bikes um, yeah. because the like That's my next question. places, yeah, because yeah, the places that you see things like that are in places like Madison, and Columbia, Maryland. Um, mm-hmm. But like, uh, nah, like if you've, I, I don't know, I see more kids riding bikes in West Baltimore and they're not like super fancy fixed gears or whatever. They're not yeah. like, I went to the yeah. bike store and I got my bike all like souped up or whatever, but there people ride bikes and like, yeah, the whole, if, if all of like all of these solutions are only things that like, I don't know, privileged people or whatever are yeah. doing, then that doesn't really change anything. So I think that part of it is also like 
pushing uh, access for everybody to be able to make these kinds of yeah, choices. Absolutely. Um, mm-hmm. Especially because, like, if all of us in this room are like, I'm going to be vegan and never ride a car or get in a car again, like, that doesn't really make a difference, right? But if it's like a, if it's at a policy level and tons and tons of people are participating, that actually yeah. can make a difference. Yeah. And if it, like, impacts the, I don't know, the, like, supply side, if it impacts, like, what, the, like the actual planning and policy if it actually makes an impact on like what's happening and what's like mm-hmm. avail- available then that can make a big difference I'm trying to think of two quick california examples yeah yeah quick, please so, do please do because california is the yeah um so california i mean this is this is national this is a like global movement really um people are really pushing for focusing on just uh you know there's like a lot of, we're, we're talking about things that kind of happen after the fact but one big thing is there's just tons of oil extraction in the United States right now through mm-hmm. uh, new techniques, new technologies, mostly fracking and other things. But like I'll use California, it's not a fracking state. Fracking is horizontal drilling, and um, there's been a lot of reporting on it on the Real News, and I've been on the show many times to talk about it. But California doesn't have that, but it has tons of oil drilling. Um, actually, since 1900, it's had the second most oil drilling in the United States behind yeah. Texas. It's not thought of that yeah. way, but there's a big movement called Keep It in the Ground, just keep you know stop drilling so much oil because once that stuff is out of the ground it's going to be marketed people are going to drive and i think that that ties Mm -hmm. to my part two in a state like california we have almost no public transportation and that's i think every city in this country needs if you want it if we're going to tackle climate change needs to be robust build out of public transportation so that people instead of like a lot of times people are kind of blackmailed into this jerry brown like to say this the former governor of california he would say, well, people drive, so how can you be against oil if you're driving? Well, what he didn't say is they have no option but to drive. California, mm. again, I live in San Diego. Mm. Mm. There's no way to get around in San Diego. Without if, a car. And it's can. very yeah. hilly. You can't yeah. really even ride a bike because you'd have to be Lance Armstrong mm. fitness level to ride up and down mm-hmm. those. So yeah. yeah, and there's a lot of states like mm-hmm. Virginia. Um, there's a lot of states in the south that are very much like that and that. And, yeah. And consequently, I think it's funny, ironically, I'm just having this discussion, hearing this from you and thinking about how much oil money is in the South. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot. It's very interesting. And you find less and less public transportation the more South you go and everybody's driving. Very interesting. We could use some public transportation here. Yeah, we need, better. We, we need we need better. better public transportation. We have public oh, yeah. public we transportation have. Have. here in Baltimore, but it's not it's not great at all. Yeah, and it should go to more places. Yeah, I yeah. guess and I guess the other I mean, thing about like giving people options is like I don't I, maybe I don't even need to say this, but like making these kinds of changes should fall on the people who are responsible for climate change in the mm-hmm. first place. Mm. Um, so like just making fuel more we just saw this play out in france in a very big way just making fuel more expensive so that people are not as inclined to drive is not a solution like Mm -hmm. people the people who are driving it's not it shouldn't be on like okay all of us should be doing everything that we can to like live in a way that we think is like good and ethical but also it's not about like it i think one thing that you can do is continue to like push in whatever ways you can for the people who created the climate crisis to actually pay to fix it rather than it following on like people to not yeah. drive as much and not be able to get mm-hmm. to the work or the grocery store or whatever mm-hmm. and that's a big pu- that's a big push within the climate movement right now in the united states and that will be increasingly so going forward is accountability for yeah, the definitely. oil gas the fossil fuel industry oil gas coal is the the wreckage that they've kind of created and that will manifest itself in the coming years and decades uh there are going to be and there already are lawsuits in which people are saying you caused this you have to pay for what you caused and mm-hmm. they're fighting very hard against that because that could cost yeah. them mm-hmm. a lot of money potentially billions yeah. of dollars yeah. but if you look at it from another perspective if they're not paying for it regular people are paying for yeah. it through their tax mm-hmm. dollars or through bailouts or and to your early, I'm so sorry, I'm talking so much. Don't know. <laughs> That's why you're here. That's, you're the guest. You're yeah. here to talk, <laughs> we Like talk. We want you to talk. <laughs> like, That's the point of this, of is to get you to talk. <laughs> um, but, but to your point earlier, too, it's not just like climate. Den- First of all, like I think that the 
even saying like the Trump administration is full of climate deniers is like in a way, and I say I say it all the time. I'm not saying yeah. like I do say this, but like it's kind of misleading because they also show they there was like a federal report last year that said that they expected uh, like the temperature of the world to rise by four degrees over pre-industrial levels. So what it, what what the mm. in, like temperature of the world was Celsius before and yeah four degrees Celsius by what like twenty. 50, I think it was four mm, degrees. I think 2100 or 20. Mm. Okay. Oh yeah. That yeah. makes more sense. Yeah. <laughs> 2100. That'd be frightening if it was um, 2050. Yeah. That's but like, similar. so, yeah, and like, like I, live that's not, that. and that's not what lots of scientists say. Like that's yeah. more than what, but still like it's not, that's coming out of the Trump administration. I don't mm. think that like all of the people who are saying that they don't believe in climate change actually don't believe in climate change. Yeah. Um, but also like, it's not just, those like it's not just people who are outwardly climate deniers who are responsible in some way like jerry brown as a governor of california exactly. did a lot of good things also i think it was twenty thousand new oil and gas permits 000. yeah that were approved during his time as governor so like yeah just as, yeah his, yeah exactly his second because he had his first stint but yeah in his last uh stint as governor twenty one thousand wells Wow. So people would actually call him, or climate, the climate community would call him, climate activist community called him Big Oil Brown, mm. even though, well, some sectors of it. There's a split. Um, that's some something I'll kind of report on as I go forward for the real news is the split within the climate advocacy community on climate solutions, I guess, mm. uh, in the state. But, yeah, um, within some segments of the climate movement, he was not. He was kind of seen as a pariah. Others mm. held him up as a hero. Mm. So tell me this, where where are there places on the earth where things are being implemented that are working? Like what like what can we look at and say, hey, uh United that. States or local government or whatever, like like implement this or copy off of this? I think you you had a pretty interesting idea with uh some yeah. Stuff that you've seen in well, California. yeah, in California, I mean, I'll just in San Diego County, I'll give a kind of a cool example that's tangible, um, small, I really could, small. But... I really could be in California right now. <laughs> it's snowing here. Yeah, it's cold it's not... as hell. And every time you say California, <laughs> start thinking about the beaches. I get horny. <laughs> I'm just like it's warmer than yesterday, though. Oh my god. Yeah, but, but that's it is, it, Yo, that's isn't that crazy? It's snowing and it's warmer than it was yesterday. Yeah. But yes, I'm sure you miss California well, right now, do. don't you? Yeah. <laughs> I told Darna before I came here Welcome that I was sad. About I'm going leaving. back. I'm going back with you. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, I'll I'm put you going, in the luggage. Going. <laughs> To, yeah, <laughs> going, going back, back to That's how Cali, we close Cali. out this episode with that song. <laughs> yes, Donna with the Biggie reference. Oh, good. Yes, let's go. All right, uh, I'm sorry. That's go all right. Ahead. I'm listening. Oh to you. yeah, so in San Diego County, there's uh, an organization named Eco Life Conservation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they um, have built out these things called uh, hydroponic farms, which is a vertical farming where it's efficient use of water because in California there's an extreme water crisis right now and a drought um, and oh this year it's rained more but like f between 2011 and 2017 there was a declared drought for how little it rained mm -hmm. um, or 2018 actually and um, so what that does it uses water more efficiently and it, mm -hmm. it's like it's an uncontained system where the water trickles back through in the greenhouse system and it's also so they have a, they do solar powered ones so it's uh, existing off of solar for any energy it needs as opposed to fossil fuel uh, okay doesn't use uh, any kind of fertilizers which come from natural natural gas byproducts or no fossil fuels at all and what they're doing I think not just what they're doing at this one place this is in a city called Escondido California in northern San Diego County they're actually they have their big one there and then they they have built smaller ones within schools for uh, lower income, kids throughout San Diego County as a means of teaching about climate change for this young generation mm. and showing them how important sustainable agriculture is, That's dope. getting people mm -hmm. involved in that. So it's climate change education and a hands-on experience. And I think that, yes, that's just San Diego County, but I, I really think like something like that could be brought to yeah. many everywhere. counties. Too. Yeah, everywhere. Mm. It's everywhere. Not and especially yeah. like communities of color too. I think. Yeah, like, yeah. We're, oh, and that's, we're like the last ones to find out, but the first ones to be. And that's affected, what they, that's know? what they yeah. do. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. mostly in yeah. South San Diego County where they actually teach this stuff, and that's to you know, many kids who are immig immigrants from Mexico um, and also 
African American people more in the South Bay. So it's like lower. It, I think it's just really important what they're doing. So that's just one example, but a tangible one. Here, um, I think so. Steve and I were talking about like if y'all asked this, what we were going to say. <laughs> um, and I was like, man, a lot of the examples I can think of are, I guess, what people would say like very small scale, but I mm -hmm. still think that those are important because lots of small scale things happening at the same time can make bigger differences. Um, so the Baltimore Compost Collective here at the Filbert Street Garden um, in Southwest Baltimore, I think is like a really cool example of, mm. um, you know, it's like mostly uh, black folks working on this composting project, turning what could be put into a trash incinerator or a landfill into, um, turning into what they call black gold and then using that to make a garden um, which mm -hmm. brings out food for people in like a food desert um, and then simultaneously first of all like they're employing tons of kids yeah, who live around that's there a, yeah. um, or maybe not tons but they're employing they're kids employing who live around kids, there yeah. um, and also teaching kids about the importance mm -hmm. of you know doing things like that um so i think that's like a cool form of like community waste management have we interviewed the guy who runs that i'm sure you have if you're watching this i'm sorry i haven't put out the piece yet um, <laughs> oh yes it's coming yeah. it's, it's in the pipeline it's, yes the, definitely yeah, to use that metaphor it's in the pipeline. because one of, because yeah. one of my roommates met the guy and you know we marvin we, yeah we yeah. and we you know we grow vegetables and stuff in my house and 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 uh one of my roommates met him a few weeks ago and was like guys like he wants to partner with us and like get our compost and like and when he was talking about him he, he not mm -hmm. only not only did he say like you know what you said like what he's doing is fucking awesome but on top of that he's like this older black dude that's like dumb excited about it and he's just like yeah. yo his personality is everything yeah, right no, definitely, definitely. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Um, I actually, so when I was in college, I worked at uh, this group of community gardens in Southwest Yonkers, which is mm -hmm. a neighborhood that's quite a bit like Baltimore. Um, there's a lot more Latino folks there, but like in terms of the, I don't know, like the even just the like city layout and like the kinds of infrastructure that there are, and even some of the dynamics with the city government, just very similar to Baltimore in lots of mm. ways. Um, and there I worked with a, a group of people who were basically teaching kids about not only how to like work in community gardens and like grow their own food and stuff but also about power in certain ways like i taught a lesson plan to a bunch of like 12 year olds one time about uh, the pentagon's fossil fuel emissions so i think mm -hmm. that stuff like that too where you can be like here is the like small scale solution that we're doing right now and this is really important here is how it connects to something bigger right is Cool as well. Mm. Uh, Wonderful. Shout uh, out to how much time do we have then? I think I think I think we've been talking for a minute. A I did while. want to uh <laughs> <laughs> No, I did want to uh I did want to get Darna to talk about a few of the important stories you've been doing that people should check out and what's coming. You talked about the one that's coming um soon, but you you have been doing a bunch of great reporting and there and also yesterday we were talking about the uh shit that's going on in dc this next week oh yeah, yeah. um uh, so just like you know darna give me just some of the most important stories you've been doing that people should look at and then steve if you can give me like right now urgent issues that people should st start paying attention mm -hmm. to policy wise sure Steve's first story, if you're watching this right now, uh, he, Steve already has a story out on the site, by the way. You should read it. Yeah, check um, it out. Yeah. It's good. I'm about to talk to you about it. Yeah. Um, real quick, some big local things happening right now are there's a bill being heard in City Hall that could force the R2 incinerator. So there's the wheel operator trash incinerator, which is that big smokestack off of I-95 that everybody knows. It says Baltimore real big. Um, could force that to either reduce its emissions drastically or if it can't shut down wheel liberator seems to think that they would have to rebuild their plant mm -hmm. so shut down um would also affect the sort of lesser known medical incinerator the largest one in the nation that's one thing there's another state bill um that is that will basically change maryland's we have this thing called a renewable portfolio standard which determines 
what gets like what is considered green or renewable energy and then how much money they get in support of that like subsidies from the government so it would take things like trash incineration and also wood burning um off of that because those are in some sense renewable but in no way clean sources of uh, sources of energy so those are some things um another big one is there's some really important legislation happening right now to uh, for water affordability um, and to stop the kind of cruel collection methods that the city has used uh, to collect on unpaid water bills, which doesn't sound like a climate issue, except that um, Baltimore is seeing a lot more rain. Last year was the wettest year mm. on record ever mm. in Baltimore. And mm. when it rains more, there's a lot more pressure on are already really old uh, sewage and water infrastructure. The sewage and water infrastructure is like in some places a hundred years old here. Yeah, hence what Um, happened in Ellicott City. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So so Mm -hmm. it's not, yeah, exactly. It's not just that flooding happens because there's more water coming from the sky. It's also that the infrastructure is incapable of handling it. Um, So to fix that, the city is under a consent decree um, with the federal EPA to spend like billions of dollars to fix that. To pay for that, they're raising people's water bills. Mm. So, in some sense, like that, actually, that is indirectly a climate story too. Um, there's some other stuff. City mm. Council is about to hear an ordinance asking the coal, the or the state basically to phase out of coal. Um, there's some important. There, there was just a ban last year passed on a uh, uh, bomb train. Inf- so, like, there's trains that ship oil that can explode, and this. And mm. new terminals for those trains from being constructed. Oh wow! Um, those are some. That I don't know. And then you can talk more about That's DC, fun. I guess. Yeah. Sure, That's and so California. Many. Yeah, um, yeah. So, and Darna will be involved in this reporting. Both her and I uh, over the next several weeks. But next week is a big thing. Um, it, there's something known as the Green New Deal, which is the progressive Democrats' big proposal to kind of revolutionize the United States energy system and kind of like the entire apparatus as a whole to tackle climate change. And phase uh, out of fossil fuels phase within out a of, decade. Yeah, mm. so it's a very ambitious proposal in in name, at least, so far. But what happens next week is we're going to see the actual bill for the first time, which will be co-sponsored by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who's and the firebrand new yeah. the new kid on yeah. the block in, yeah. in DC She's and a superstar superstar yeah, yeah. so fun she just <laughs> this is not an important thing Sorry. to say but she's uh, been amazing. posting on Instagram stories about her skincare routine, which is cute. Uh-huh. I'm sorry. Let's keep going. Okay. Let's keep going. <laughs> well, and I'm actually, but it's funny. So that's actually it's cool. We're talking about it this way because she's uh, co-sponsoring the bill with a very old senator named Ed Markey uh, from oh, Massachusetts, cool. who's oh. about <laughs> seven. Me. Yeah. You're excused. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he's kind of like the old guard of climate act, kind of climate advocate, uh, con- congressional people. And he nice. was around in uh, during the Obama era. He was the co-sponsor of a bill called the Waxman Markey, uh, which was ca- a cap and trade bill. We don't have to get into cap and trade, but that was a controversial proposal among people who cared about climate change. They thought it was a kind of a watered-down, half-baked solution to the climate crisis um, and also got opposition from conservatives and the bill did not pass, um, didn't ever go to Obama's desk. So that was, Markey was a key part of that first one. So it's interesting to see about roughly a decade later, we'll see what mm. happens now. And there's there are probably real split, splits yeah. that we're going to see between those same communities of what yeah. should what should and should not be in the Green New yeah. Deal. So we're going to follow that closely. In California, um, without getting into too much depth, but I'm working on a multi-part series right now looking at the new governor, Gavin Newsom, mm. and looking at what is he going to do and what do mm. people on the ground want him to do about climate change from a variety of perspectives. Mm. So those are the two kind of big things coming in the next yeah. couple of weeks. And then the last thing I'll say is, uh, we sent a reporter to Puerto Rico, um, and this will be coming in the next couple. I of like weeks. how you said that. You tried to, <laughs> Puerto, like, Puerto you tried Rico. to say it like a Puerto yeah. Rican. Yeah, it's um, okay, Steve. I appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate the attempt. That's really effort. nice. Yeah. That's really That's nice. Shout yeah. out to Steve. 
Yeah, we have some nice. Try to do it like uh, all American, yeah. Puerto Rico. <laughs> yeah. Not that bad. Puerto, Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. <laughs> yeah. No, I like that. Puerto Puerto, Puerto Rico. Rico. Puerto Rico. Yeah. So we have a we had a reporter go there, <laughs> uh, see what was going on on the ground in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria, which is another climate change fueled mm-hmm. disaster. But more importantly, we were looking at what's being imposed upon the country in the right. aftermath of Hurricane Maria, which has yet to be really reported by anyone. We kind of found a unique angle, so look out for that in the next nice. couple of weeks. Yeah. Cool. And, and then in the in the meantime, like we know that there are also lots of important things happening in the rest of the country and world, so send us pitches. Absolutely. Yes. Send us tips. Yeah, we're open yeah. to uh, ideas, definitely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Our email addresses are... Our first names at therealnews.com. The real exactly. Um, <laughs> Simple. That's that's a great segue to wrap it up. Um, I think, uh, thank y'all so much. I was very excited to talk to y'all because, like, Darn, I've told you several times, you have made this topic sexy to me. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm so, like, you know, I'm, I'm really, like, personally trying to do everything I can. It. Trying to do mm-hmm. everything I can to make a change. I'm going to have to slow down on my meat. Apparently, according to you now. <laughs> I'll uh, try. I will try. I definitely will. Um, but most importantly, um, I think you're right. Uh, people should follow. Um, check out the stories that Darna and Steve are doing. Um, and if you are a supporter of the Real News Network, we want to thank you sincerely for all that you do to keep us going. We are a nonprofit Uh, news organization we don't take any funding from corporations and we don't do advertisements so we are totally viewer funded if you're watching the real news network and you haven't contributed uh, please uh, do so Uh, there's a donate button below this video Um, but most importantly you can always reach out to us give us feedback uh, email us about any stories that you feel are important that we're not covering and let us know what's going on. Shout out to the folks making this happen behind the scenes. Stephen Frank, Dwayne Gladden, uh, Dave Hebden, uh, and and all the people uh, making this happen. Everybody. Everybody. <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> Stay tuned. We're going to continue doing these discussions with the Real News staff. You're going to get to meet us, get to understand who we are while we're here, uh, because we think it's important for you to know, uh, because you keep us going. So thank you for watching the Real News Network, and we will see y'all on the next one. Bye. Bye.